Today, we have uh, Ed Price, um, who is a former atheist of Jewish background, became a Baha'i in 73, while he was a student at the University of Virginia. He's currently the vice president, writer, and producer for Spring Green Films, LLC. And this is the company that recently produced The, the Gate, The Dawn of the Baha'i Faith, the uh, documentary uh, biography of the Bob that many of you, ha of you have seen. Excellent uh, movie, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, at University of Virginia, he got a BA in psychology and religious studies, and then subsequently a master's degree in education in curriculum and instruction from National University in California. Uh, as I mentioned, he's an author of the Divine Curriculum, Divine Design, Volume 1, 2015, plus five volumes since then, which discuss the missions of the great divine educators in the Abrahamic lineage. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, the Bob, and Baha'u'llah. He's been working on the volume on the Bob lately. Good timing with, uh, of course, the movie. And he's also lectured on many, many different uh, topics uh, in both Baha'i and non-Baha'i venues. So with that introduction, we'll now turn everything over to Ed. And Ed, welcome to the Wilmot Institute's web talk series. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Thank you very much. Well, greetings to everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank Rob Stockman for inviting, in, inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I want to give a quick comment on, um, first off, the books that, that Rob mentioned. Only the volume one is published at this time. The others will be coming out in the future. Um, I'd like to talk about what I plan to cover today. Um, I have basically five things I want to go over. Um, I'm going to give you a few moments on the backstory of this book, The Divine Curriculum, and, uh, and why I wrote it, and um, why it became a series and not just one book. And then I want to do a layout of uh, of volume one, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the table of contents. And then we're going to go into the concept of the divine curriculum. And then we're going to be discussing the story of the manifestations and their lessons. What was the actual curriculum? And then what does the curriculum add up to? Um, referring to the last uh, 4,000 years. So if you're looking at my screen, you see two quotes. Um, you see two quotes here. And you notice Abdu'l-Baha in these quotes uh, makes this really interesting comment. All humankind are as children in a school and the dawning points of light. The sources of divine revelation are the teachers, wondrous and without fear. And then the other quote, O thou true friend, read in the school of God, the lessons of the spirit and learn from love's teacher, the innermost truths. Seek out the secrets of heaven and tell the, of the overflowing grace and favor of God. So here you see two very explicit references where uh, Abdul Baha uh, refers to the fact that uh, all of creation is a classroom. So uh, let's go into my book, why I did this. Um, there was uh, a time about uh, 12, 12 years ago when I was reflecting and thinking deeply about the way the Baha'is and non-Baha'is of the world understand the faith and also the way we're going about teaching the faith. And um, I came to a conclusion that the way we teach the faith could be improved. Uh, and two things featured prominently in my mind we needed to have an increased emphasis on the person of Baha'u'llah himself and then on his mission. And when I started this work, I faced a sudden realization. Um, I discovered that it wasn't really possible to do a book only on the mission of Baha'u'llah. And it had to do with this quote, which I'm showing in front of you, where Abdul Baha says, about the manifestations of God. There's no differentiation possible in their mission and teachings. Now, I remember the day I first came across this quote. Um, I was using the ocean 
uh, database program and I was using the keyword mission and then this quote came up and I literally shouted at the computer screen, oh, Abdul Baha, why did you have to go and say that? Because once I understood what he was saying that um, the mission of Baha'u'llah is the same as the mission of all the messengers of God, the mission of Jesus, the mission of Moses, the mission of Abraham and Buddha and so forth, so that it only really made sense to tell the mission of Baha'u'llah in the larger context of the mission of all of the manifestations of God. And he said it was not possible to differentiate them. So I realized uh, the task in front of me was much more than just the mission of Baha'u'llah, but it was the mission of all of the manifestations of God. So I realized I had to do all of the manifestations, but as soon became clear, I had to go about this task without showing any favoritism or partiality towards any of them. Uh, very often you'll have Christians or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists. Each of them will do work on their religion and they'll always seem to have an attitude about, you know, my guy is better than your guy. And even in Baha'i community, you'll find Baha'is speaking with great enthusiasm about their faith and it seems as if they have a favorite. Well, the thing is, we're not supposed to have any favorites. Um, at the same time, I realized that all of the prior divine educators were preparing humanity for the coming of Baha'u'llah. So this is, for example, this, this amazing quote where Baha'u'llah says, the purpose underlying all of creation is the revelation of this most sublime, this most holy day, the day known as the day of God. Well, so on the one hand, each of the missions of the prophets of God is the same mission and they're all also at the same time uh, preparing for the mission of Baha'u'llah to come. So we had this dual uh, aspect that needed to be dealt with. So I ended up spending years on this project and produced a multi-volume series. You can see the, the titles uh, that are there. Um, only volume one is published at this time. Um, volume two is in progress. Volume three, four, and five are already written. And volume five is expected to be out in 2019. And volume six is about halfway finished. Um, the reason I'm jumping out of sequence and jumping to the Bob uh, volume five uh, right away is because as everybody realizes, the um, in the Baha'i world realizes that 2019 is the 200th anniversary of the birth of the Bab. And so I would like to have my volume out in time for the bicentenary of the Bab. So let's talk about the layout of volume one. Okay, so volume one has a certain logical flow to it. There is an introduction and an overview of the six manifestations of God, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, the Bab, and Baha'u'llah. And each of these overview chapters provides sort of a helicopter view, high level view on what each of these manifestations of God have done. So um, let me click on this for a second going to open up. There we go. So I've gone to my table of contents. And so you should be seeing my Word document here. And so like for Abraham, there's the introduction, there's mission and teachings, what happens after Abraham, and the stature of Abraham in which we discuss the um, contributions of Abraham to divine civilization and to the divine curriculum. And you see all of the chapters are structured this way, the intro, the mission, the afterwards, and then the stature. With the exception of the Muhammad chapter, because of what's gone on in the world in recent years, I added two sections before getting to the introduction, which enables us to separate the ideology of the extremists from the true faith of Muhammad. And so that's, that was a very important six or so pages in which uh, the reader can really separate out one from the other. Other than that, the pattern remains the same, then the Bob and Baha'u'llah. Okay, so go back to the slide. So if you're gonna write a book on the divine curriculum, it seems pretty smart and wise to say a few words about what we mean by curriculum. So I had a chapter 
uh, actually two chapters on what do we mean by curriculum and what would our guess be if God is the one designing the curriculum, uh, what would be the characteristics of the curriculum? Of course, none of us knows the thinking of God. So this is uh, significantly uh, speculative. But one can make the assumption that God's curriculum would, be, would not be inferior to the curriculum standards that are used today uh, by, um, by human beings. So this gives us, and we can use that kind of as a template to figure out what some of the features of curriculum would be. So after that's done, then the book goes in, really the meat of the argument begins. And we talk about, talk about divine reality, who and what is God and the concept of God, and in particular, the infinity of God. And then we deal with the next subject, which is divine design, which basically addresses three questions. Why does the creator create? If God is so infinite, why bother? He doesn't need us. He doesn't need his any creatures. Baha'u'llah writes, we can well dispense with all of our creatures. So if there's no need for us, why do it? And so it turns out is some very wonderful and beautiful reasons that are given in the sacred teachings that tell us why the creator creates. Okay, so now we know that the creator is going to create something and, and he has a reason for doing so. So then you ask, well, for what purpose? For what purpose is he going to bring into being these creatures? Well, we're going to find out a little bit about that. And then given that the creator, the creator has certain purposes, well, what is he going to create that will fulfill those purposes? So why? does the creator create? For what purposes does the creator create? And then what does the creator create? Now, it turns out that one of the things the creator decided to do is he decided to create us in need of education. He didn't create us perfect creatures. He created us creatures that are fallible with free will, with the capacity to learn. And so we're going to make mistakes. And consequently, we need teachers. And so he created a system in which he created us in such a way that we are in need of an educator. And so then this brings us to the subject of who are the divine educators? And what is their actual reality and station? What do they do and how should human respond to their summons? So that's quite a journey uh, taking almost 400 pages. And then we get to the conclusion of the volume where we discuss uh, a couple of key themes like what does it mean to stay current with the divine curriculum? And what is the objective of the journey? And it turns out that it's spiritual and profound intellectual discernment. So that's the logical flow of volume one. So let's talk about the divine curriculum. So here are the basic premises of the entire series. I coined this phrase all of creation is a classroom. But as you saw from the quotes on the title page, um, Abdu'l-Baha makes it very clear that creation is a classroom, that this is all, all this physical reality, this universe that we live in is really one fantastic, amazing classroom. And this is the school of God. And we, the human beings, are the students in this school. When did the school begin? Who can say? Nobody knows. But my guess would be that as soon as human beings were conscious and able to walk the earth, sometime in our very, very distant past, God has probably been educating us from day one. It's just my, my theory on that. So God teaches us through divine educators. Now, the divine educators covered in this series are particularly the Abrahamic lineage. That's six messengers of God. There have been others such as Zoroaster, Buddha, and Krishna, and still others that throughout history, the Bab and Baha'u'llah tell us that the divine messengers are, are innumerable throughout history. And then actually, so now have you ever heard of a teacher without a curriculum, without something to teach? So what curriculum has God been teaching and towards what purposes? All right. So now here's the same screen, but streamlined. 
help you to uh, understand the concept. So the school of God is creation. The students are the human beings. The teachers are the divine educators. The textbooks are their scriptures and the curriculum is their teachings. Actually, the more you go into this analogy of all of creation as a classroom, it really lines up perfectly. And I really haven't been able to find any, any flaws in this uh, way of thinking about divine revelation. And of course, the purposes of God uh, in having this classroom in the first place. So let's take a look at the divine curriculum for the last 6,000 years. We are told in the Baha'i writings that basically since Adam to the present day has been approximately 6,000 years. And there's been numerous messengers of God throughout history. Now you see the little arcs there in the names of the messengers of God. Um, this is not meant to be complete. Uh, this is just to illustrate that from one age to the next, the, the cycles, the dispensations move forward. So basically all of recorded history up until the year 1844 uh, fits into this time frame of the Adamic cycle, also known as the prophetic cycle. Here's a way to look at it on a, on a timeline. And this actually is drawn to scale. As you can see, over time, these messengers of God appear approximately every 500 to 1,000 years. And there's been many, many of them. And they're compared in the writings to be like the sunrise of the spiritual truth. Now, this next slide is um, a recent creation. And I went to great pains to draw everything to scale. So you can see where these manifestations of God or these divine educators appear on the timeline of history. So starting with creation about 3100 BC, which is about 5100 years ago, to Abraham, Moses, Zoroaster, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad. And then in the 19th century, we got two, which is the first time in history, far as anyone knows, that we got two messengers of God in that they were contemporaries of one another. So this is the timeline of history of the messengers of God in the uh, cycle, the last 6,000 years. Now, this chart is pretty much the same information, but you can see that this information here on the scripture associated with Revelation, the part of the world where they originated and where their influence was felt, so and the names of their scriptures. So that's just an interesting uh, thing uh, to take a look at. By the way, um, it's my understanding that from Rob that after this talk, I will be providing him these slides in a PDF format. So I believe this information will be available to all of you um, after, after this talk. So here's the thing. We, we all know that there's so much confusion in the domain of religion. How do you bring order and coherence to that? And so let me say a few words about my approach. So if you think about religion from the point of the students in the classroom, that is all of us human beings, what you have is divergent and contradictory understandings of what the teachers are teaching. But if you look at the teachers themselves, they're not confused at all about their own teachings. That is their own curriculum. Their scriptures, their, script, their, their textbooks, is the only way to find out the unity and the continuity among them. Also, each of these messengers of God appeared at a particular time in history. So it really is necessary for us to understand each and every one of them within their contextual circumstances of the age in which they live. <clears throat> so we have a choice. We could focus on the divergent and contradictory understandings of the human beings, or we could focus on the unified and coherent and con have it with continuity material that comes from the teachers. So in order to find the, the unity in these religions of the world, I wanted to, I found it was necessary to focus on the what I call the divine side of religion, not as much on the human side. And so inspired by the faith, I treat them all with um, uh, even handedness. 
So one of the phrases that we find in the Baha'i writings that describes the approach to the faith is the continuity of divine revelation. The actual phrase progressive revelation doesn't show up in the writings that often. But Sheikh Yafrindi just describes, for example, what Baha'u'llah is talking about as the continuity of divine revelation, that the divine educators are all teachers and the faculty of the school of God which is all of creation. They're working together, not in competition. Also, everybody is aware of the fact that the religions have great differences from one another. So there's similarities on the one hand and there's differences on the other hand. There's unity and there's distinction, constancy and progression. So it's so very interesting to see how they fit together. Uh, Abdu'l-Bahá has made this really, really interesting statement in every dispensation, the light of divine guidance has been focused upon one central theme. We're gonna be thinking about this quite a bit during this talk. So here we are again, where Abdu'l-Bahá says that we have a need for an educator. Were it not for the coming of these holy manifestations of God, all mankind would be found on the plane of the animal. They would remain darkened and ignorant like those who've been denied schooling and who have never had a teacher or trainer. So God does not want us to be um, uneducated, uh, uh, brutal or uncivilized. So he's provided us divine teachers and he's instituted schools among civilization. But without it, we would be little more than animals. As to the divine educators, they are to be understood as the mirror of God, reflecting God's beauty, his might, his glory, his own self. So I've already alluded to the dual station of the manifestations, which in Baha'u'llah's work, the Book of Certitude, he describes as unity and distinction. Here's an example of him talking about unity. He talks about the manifestations of God existing together in a station of pure abstraction and essential unity. Even as he hath revealed, no distinction do we make between any of his messengers. That's actually a quote from the Quran, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, but see how emphatic it is. No distinction do we make between any of his messengers. And here is uh, that quote that I showed you earlier. There's no differentiation possible in their mission and teachings. They are all reflectors of reality. They are all promulgators of the religion of God. Now, at one point, Baha'u'llah was asked a question by one of the followers, which was, which of the prophets of God should be regarded as superior to others? And this was the answer. He says that their unity is absolute. God, the creator says, there is no distinction whatsoever among the bearers of my message. They all have but one purpose. The secret is the same secret, to prefer one in honor to the other, to exalt certain ones above the rest is in no wise to be permitted. So clearly you can see friends that any behavior um, when we're talking about the manifestations of God, to exalt one above the others is in no wise permitted. So we're entitled to our personal feelings, our favorites in terms of our own private emotions. But when we are in the world sharing the message with, with the faith of the faith with other people, we must conduct ourselves in this fashion. To exalt certain ones above the rest is in no wise to be permitted. So I saw this in the writings when I started my work and I realized that if I was gonna deal, be telling the story of the mission of all of the divine messengers, I had to be absolutely uh, fair and even handed and equally enthusiastic about all of them. Here's a wonderful um, um, cartoon from Charlie Brown. I'll just give you a moment to take a look at it. Um, 
pouring myself a little drink while you read it. So it's so interesting. If we're looking at the sun, it seems so obvious that it's one sun. But Lucy here seems to not quite get the point. And this is kind of kind of the way the conversation goes with people when we uh, try to explain that the divine messengers are like the sun of truth and it's all one spiritual sunrise. So now we must pay attention to the station of distinction. Each manifestation of God hath a distinct individuality, a definitely prescribed mission, is characterized by a special attribute, fulfills a definite mission, and is entrusted with a particular revelation. So this tells us that there are, in fact, distinctions to be made. Um, so there's the oneness of religion, which is very, very important, which is uh, a very profound teaching. But at the same time, we must not be naive. We must not be foolish. We must give full acknowledgement to the fact that there is also this distinction. So take a look at this from the point of view of a jigsaw puzzle. So if you think, if you think about the divine messengers throughout history, um, you realize that each one of them came at a certain time in history, and each one of them was revealing some of the truth of God, the the portion that was right for that time and that place in history, and also that was necessary to build for future stages to come. So each each piece of the jigsaw puzzle sets the stage for the ones to follow. And each piece that's put in there builds on what was revealed by four. Each part reveals, each, each piece reveals part of the total picture. The pieces are different and yet they are quite similar in their characteristics. Every piece is essential to the whole. So if you're a Baha'i today, do you read only Baha'i writings? No, you read the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. You read all of the scriptures because every piece is essential to the whole. Once again, no distinction do we make between any of God's messengers. On the other hand, the message of Baha'u'llah is the most recent one, so it speaks to the age in which we are living, so we definitely should be paying attention to that as well. So here's a statement from Shoy Effendi where he talks about the continuity of the revelation how their, their revelations correlate with one another, their books correlate with one another, and they basically have the singleness of their aims and purposes. Does that remind you of the statement that Abdul Baha made that there's no differentiation possible in their missions, the singleness of their aims and purposes? So this is a very important reminder that they are all on the same mission. Now let's spend just a moment or two on the concept of continuity. Because the, the, con the word continuity ha is filled with potential. So I, I pulled this out of the dictionary. Continuity refers to an uninterrupted connection or succession. There's a close union of parts and a connected whole. So let's, let's consider that. Here's an example of human continuity. That's my baby picture that my mother gave me years ago. Okay, so that's one, one stage of life. Here's me where I grew up, with my, my standing beside my brother. I'm the, one, I'm the young one, he was older than me. And um, I don't look like the baby anymore, I'm different. Here I am on my, the day I graduated from high school, and that's my older brother. He's changed too along the way. And then here's me with my wife and my daughter when she was eight years old and we were at a very important uh, gathering that day and we took this uh, very memorable photo. So, a baby, a boy, a youth, a man, every stage is unique. Every stage looks different and yet this is just one living person. This illustrates how unity and distinction are both implied by the term continuity. So now let's take this idea of continuity and apply it to 
the revelation sent by God. So first off, we've got to keep in mind, now this is a graphic I created. It's not authoritative, it's just my own interpretation. We would be expecting the divine curriculum to pursue the goals that God has for all of creation. So the purpose of divine revelation would stipulate what the goal of the divine curriculum is, and the goal of the divine curriculum would be keyed towards the purpose of man's creation. And of course, the purpose of man's creation would be keyed towards the purpose underlying all of creation. And of course, the purpose underlying all of creation would feed into both the purpose of revelation and the goal of divine revelation. So you see these aspects are all interconnected with one another. But the most important thing to gather here is that the goal of the divine curriculum is going to be targeted towards the purpose of man's creation and the purpose of all creation. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's what Baha'u'llah says is the purpose of creation. He says, having created the world and all that liveth and moveth therein, he will through his unconstrained and sovereign will confer upon him the unique distinction and capacity to know him and to love him. And that he says that this capacity is the generating impulse and the primary purpose underlying the whole of creation. So if this is the reason for creation, well, let's ponder for a second. What does it mean to actually know something? Um, does a computer with all of the information it has on its hard drive and storage, does it have knowledge? Does it know anything? No, not really, because it's just an automaton. It's just um, a, a machine. It has no consciousness. It has no self, no identity, no thoughts, no memory, no capacity to reflect. And most importantly, the computer has no free will. So it cannot choose to learn. It cannot do anything other than what it's programmed to do. So if we understand what knowing means, we realize that free will is necessarily implied. Now, as to the loving somebody or something, can you imagine a, ro a romantic love that um, was uh, forced, that was programmed? If my computer, when it boots up every morning, says to me, Edward, I love you, should I get a warm fuzzy over that because the computer is saying, I love you? Well, no, not really, because the computer is again, it's just an automaton. It doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't have the ability to choose to, to give its love freely. So once again, to actually love something uh, implies the necessity of free will. So it, I would make the argument that to know God and to love God necessarily implies that we must also be able to choose God. So I think of this as knowing, loving, and choosing God. So throughout history, there has been a divine curriculum taught to us through the different messengers of God. Each has had a certain emphasis along the way. Remember this quote from before, in the, the light of divine guidance has been focused upon one central theme in every dispensation. So now here we are back to the jigsaw puzzle. And we see that Beside each name is a summary of what each of the manifestations of God has taught humanity. So to make it a little easier to read, we'll take the names of the messengers of God off of the screen and we'll just look at the content. And what I'm suggesting to you is knowing good and evil, law of God, the oneness of God, being able to fulfill your duty, the advent of the, of the promised one, submitting your will to God, learning how to overcome suffering, knowing the kingdom of God and loving God, all of these things together, quickening and uniting the world, establishing God's kingdom on earth. If you take all of that together, it seems to me a very good curriculum that will take you to the objectives, which is to know God, to love God and to choose God. 
And it's very, also very important to recognize that the divine messengers are not in any way competing with one another. They're like members of the faculty. They are team members on the, in the huddle on the football field or whatever metaphor pleases you. The divine messengers are completely cooperative, completely working together, loving each other, honoring one another, speaking well of one another, preparing one for the other, the next one to come. They are all integrated and harmonious. And Baha'u'llah makes this very, very clear with this statement. He says, behold them all abiding in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, seated upon the same throne, uttering the same speech and proclaiming the same faith. But remember, each one is performing a particular function in history as well. So they're uni they have their unity and they have their unique contributions as well. They're, they're very much the same and also they're very, they have their differences as well. But differences and similarities combined, you put it all together, they're pursuing the objectives of the divine curriculum from century upon century, millennia after millennium. So let's spend a moment on what they all taught. So if you look at what Adam brought to humanity, like if you go to the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible, and also as told in uh, in the Quran, what we actually see in the story of Adam and Eve is the emergence of humanity from its animal condition. The, the idea that there's, you have to have a conscience for your actions, that you're held accountable as an individual, that you, you have intellect, you can commit sins with your free will if you so choose. You have a soul and you're responsible and as the story makes quite clear, you're very, you're very much going to be held accountable. So if you think about it for a second, um, if you watch a lion in the savanna jumping, pouncing upon a deer and killing it and slaughtering it, has, that, has the lion committed a sin? Well, it's done something brutal but even that really doesn't apply because that's like a value judgment. Has the animal done anything that it shouldn't have done? Has it committed a sin? I think we would all agree that the answer is no, because it's just acting according to its nature. But a human being doing something similar to that is, is uh, barbaric and sinful and horrible. It's because human beings are not the same as an animals. We have intellect, we have conscience, we have free will. So we are thereby to be held accountable. So the story of Adam and Eve, whatever the other attributes of the story might be, in my mind, one of the major takeaways is that the story of Adam and Eve is helping us to understand the emergence of the human condition, the beginning of that 6,000 year cycle of divine education. It's really the promotion from being animal-like to being a human being now. So we get to Noah. Noah gives us more, uh, more of a treatment on uh, choosing good versus evil. And of course, the, the sinful people got washed away in the flood. The Bible says they thought only of doing evil every day. And, but Noah and his family were saved because they were good people. So the story of Noah is about uh, choosing to do the good. Abraham, some centuries later, comes along, and his contribution is very, very interesting. Actually, Abraham, I'm kind of kind of contradict myself. I, I kind of do have a favorite. Abraham is one of my favorites because I love the way he teaches the oneness of God. He fights against idolatry. And I think the story of the near sacrifice of Isaac um, reveals that uh, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people at that stage, um, they were going to value and treat sacred human life. So do not harm the boy, do not sacrifice him as an act of worship. Um, hold human life sacred and don't do that anymore. And so Abraham instituted this 
establishment of the oneness of God, the fact that we get our sense of right and justice and good from God, and also he established the sacredness of human life. He's a wonderful, wonderful figure in history. Moses continues the education about the oneness of God. He is, continues developing the idea of the covenant with God, which means you enter into a contract with God. He continues fighting idolatry, and which is the worship of a false God. And um, most significantly, Moses introduces the law of God. We all know this as the Ten Commandments and the many other commandments of the Torah. So some more centuries go by and Jesus appears and he begins to educate humanity about the kingdom of God, both on earth and in heaven. And he teaches us about the afterlife, the importance of salvation, the being born again and the Holy Spirit. And he teaches us to love, love God and to love our fellow man. So I was running out of space on my PowerPoint slide. So I'm only mentioning one thing about Muhammad. Muhammad is not well understood in the Western world, but he teaches uh, the word Islam literally means submission to the will of God. The word Muslim literally means one who submits to God. The word Allah in Arabic literally means the God. So Muhammad was teaching the same God that Abraham and Moses and Jesus taught about. And Muhammad's teaching was Islam, submission to the will of God. So now we come to the Bab in the 19th century. The Bab and Baha'u'llah actually, they teach many, many beautiful things. Um, my new volume on the Bab coming out next year will have an extensive section discussing the teachings of the Bab, but briefly, the Bab talked about how the beauty of God's revelation is reflected in all things. So everything in creation is a sign of the revelation of God. God does not come down and become embodied into the stone or the tree or the piece of wood or whatever. He's not in the objects, but the light of the Holy Spirit shines on everything and the beauty of God, his qualities and attributes is reflected in all things. Bob also taught the importance of seeing the underlying oneness and unity of all people and of all things and seeing the light of God in everybody else and in yourself as well. So he refers to this as the perspective of unity. Very, very interestingly, the Bab articulates a very clear idea of progressive revelation, which by the way, we now know is the continuity of divine revelation. He teaches some very exalted spiritual and ethical principles, uh, guiding humankind towards spiritual perfection. And then of course, Baha'u'llah teaches many things, um, but his central teaching is the oneness of humanity. So this is an overview of the what they taught. So let me ask you a question. Does this look like a fairly comprehensive spiritual curriculum to you? If you learn to do all these things, knowing God, obeying him, loving him, submitting to his will, reflecting him in all that you say and do and think and feel, and if you are uniting with all people, would your material or animalistic nature be under control, under the control of your spiritual nature or not? So age to age, the continuity of the divine curriculum requires these similarities and these differences, this unity and distinction. The light of divine guidance was focused on one theme, but over time, on one theme in each dispensation, but over time, an entire curriculum has been taught to humanity. So here we are 6,000 years after this process in recorded history has begun. Of course, God has probably been teaching us into the far, far, far distant past. We've only been telling the story of the last 6,000 years. But 
after 6,000 years or 4,000 years since Abraham, uh, what did it all add up to? So Abdu Baha has a few things to tell us. He says the mission of the prophets of God. Notice how he speaks in the plural here. It's not the mission of this prophet or that prophet. It's the mission of all of them. The mission of all of the prophets of God has been to train the souls of humanity and to free them from the thraldom of natural instincts and physical tendencies. So do you know what the word thraldom is? It means like slavery. You are under its control, under its influence, not free to choose for yourself. The thraldom of natural instincts and physical tendencies. So the mission of the prophets has been to train humanity to rise above our physical instincts and tendencies. Of course, as we've been covering, it includes, this process includes knowing, loving, and choosing God. This involves elevating the soul above your own selfish interests. Very, very interesting. In the Baha'i writings, evil is described as the insistent self. We don't believe in a separate independent personage with red skin and you know uh, horns and a pitchfork. We don't we don't believe in a personification of evil. In fact, that the evil that exists is within each and every one of us. It's the insistent self, the material, selfish, egotistical side of your nature that needs to be subdued by the more angelic spiritual side of your nature the selfless the loving the kind the humanitarian the generous the forgiving side of your nature so the divine curriculum has literally been to conquer evil that is to say the insistent self which is the real source of evil and to make us more heavenly in nature uh, to make human nature more heavenly and this, of course, we can understand on a collective level, brings us to God's civilization on earth. Another word for that phrase is, uh, Baha'u'llah uses the term, the all glorious kingdom. And of course, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, we know this as the kingdom of God on earth. So the divine curriculum has been heading all of us, all of humanity in this direction certainly setbacks, but compared to the brutality of human sacrifices and, and idolatry 4,000 years ago, consider the great progress that humanity has made and continues to make, despite the problems we still have today in the world. So a little bit more on this notion of the insistent self. Here are some writings. And I'm not gonna read them word for word because you'll have the PDF later on. But you see here that the, it's referred to as the promptings of self and desire and the dark side of human nature. The crusade that the faith is on, if we would to use such a word, is against the instant self, the evil promptings of the human heart. The demands of the instant self, the promptings of the self, summoning it to wickedness and so forth. Every human nature, every human being has a spiritual nature and a material nature. And the purpose of each person is to subdue the material nature, which inclines him towards evil. And instead to replace that by developing his spiritual nature so that he can manifest praiseworthy attributes. And so this will lead us to a, a civilization, not just material civilization, which is increasingly advanced, but also divine civilization. You can take the most advanced material civilization, and if it is devoid of spiritual qualities, Abdul Baha says it's like a dead body. It might be beautiful in all of its outward features, but it has no grace, no elegance to it. It's, it's, it's not really spiritually alive. 
So notice what Abdul Baha says at the bottom of this quote. Until man is born again from the world of nature, the animal world, that is to say, become detached from the world of nature. He is essentially an animal. And it is the teachings of God which convert this animal into a human soul. So the divine curriculum has been driving humanity in this direction, both individually and collectively, ever and ever larger groups of unity from tribes and cities, all the way up to nations and now the possibility of creating an angelic civilization for the entire planet. So here's an interesting perspective. So this actually is drawn to scale. So Baha'u'llah says that his dispensation will be at least a thousand years. It could be longer. But working with that thousand year figure, if you put that like on a 12 inch ruler, you can see that we've gone about a little bit more than two inches on the ruler or about 17% of the thousand years has already passed. And you can see the blue on the screen, about 80 to 83% of the thousand years is remaining. And you can see that where we are in history, uh, about 174, 175 years after the initiation of the faith. So we are very much at the beginning stages of this process. And the writings tell us that there will be the most great peace or the kingdom of God on earth established during this thousand year period. Nobody knows when, nobody knows what's the date. It may be not actually even be a date, just a gradual emergence of a process through, through a process of steady human development over the centuries. But at the end of this thousand years, before the next manifestation of God appears, what we will see is indeed the, mount, the establishment of the most great peace, the coming of age of humanity, and the full conversion of the animal man into the angelic human soul. That's the mission, that's what the divine curriculum has been aiming us towards for 6,000 years. And now in this thousand year period, it's actually on the table. It's not a future hope. It is now a realization in progress. And during this thousand years, it will be fully realized. This, you know, people may agree or disagree as their own personal opinions, but what I'm saying is my understanding of what the Baha'i writings are teaching. Now, what's very, very interesting is that this 6,000 year period is known as this Adamic cycle or as the cycle of prophecy. And the writings tell us that it sets the stage for a much longer period of human history yet to come. If you can look at this graphic, you can see where we are we are in the early stages of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. And there are many more divine messengers to come in these thousand years. And what's very, very interesting is that the writings of the faith imply that, uh, I don't know about that screen, I'm gonna move on. The, the writings of the faith imply that once this divine civilization is established on earth. That really turns out to be the beginning of human history. Look at the second bullet point in this quote, where Shoghi Findi is talking about this future time when the full potentialities of the divine curriculum and Baha'u'llah's revelation will be fully realized. And he says at that time, the earth will be acclaimed, um, the planet will be acclaimed as the earthly heaven, capable of fulfilling that ineffable destiny fixed for it from time immemorial by the love and wisdom of its creator. So 
this is just a hint in Shoghi Effendi's writing. This is just uh, a tantalizing glimpse that even after the establishment of God's kingdom on earth, there are extraordinarily amazing, unimaginable, fantastic things yet to come for humanity. This is a mission of a message of incredible hopefulness and optimism, while not in the least bit ignoring the fact that we are living in times of trouble and tribulation. But the long term future of humanity is assured and it's dazzlingly bright. So by pursuing and supporting the divine curriculum, we in our lifetimes, we get to contribute however small our share towards the movement of humanity, towards this ineffable destiny. The word ineffable is very interesting. It refers to a truth that cannot be expressed in human words. There's no words for it at this point. So I come to the conclusion that the 6,000 year period of human history has really been a period of preparation. Everything we know of human history so far has been getting us ready. Ready for what? Okay, the dispensation of Muhammad was the last one of the Adamic cycle. When Muhammad's dispensation ended, the Adamic cycle ended because it was ex succeeded by the dispensation of the Bab, which term terminated the Islamic dispensation and it terminated the Adamic cycle. So in my view, I'm just giving my personal opinion here. That was the end of the beginning of human history. And now we come to the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. It simply marks the beginning of the middle of human history. The long, beautiful, unimagined future of human history is just beginning. That long strength of stretch of time during which what it means to be fully human finally and completely emerges. And so there we go. So that's my presentation today. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, I don't know how to proceed with the computer, but I'm willing to turn it back over to Rob. I guess we have a Q&A session. But anybody who wishes to uh, speak with me um, my email is there, my phone number is there, and I would be happy to uh, be in communication with any of you if you want to discuss these important themes um, going forward. Thank you again. Thanks, thanks Ed. That, that was very interesting, and, and I think you have a, a, an excellent uh, thesis that the various major uh, themes of the different manifestations of God are indeed sort of in continuity with each other and building on each other. Um, I like complementary because they're sort of different aspects sometimes. Sometimes they build on, sometimes they fill out and flesh out. That's right. That's the unity and distinction that we were referring to. Right. I, I think that's a very good um, way of looking at the, the the basic teachings when they're when they're phrased this way, of course, because you can get into the weeds in terms of all the different twists and turns and rituals and revealed prayers and all these kinds of things that, that can make it a little more complicated of a story. But, but sometimes you need to look at the forest uh, first and uh, worry about the trees later, I guess you could say. We well, do have a couple of questions. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say that volume one was to be a look at the forest, to use your terminology. And volumes two through six will be looking at the individual uh, dispensations in depth. Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, should I click on something to stop sharing my PowerPoint? Or no, I, I mean I don't know if you can see me. I can see you. Um, can, but you can see me. What does the audience see? Right now, they see your PowerPoint, you and me, and that's just fine. That's why we'll leave it. Very good. Um, I do have uh, two questions so far, and I'm sure we'll get some more. Paul okay. asks uh, whether you would care to comment about gender language in reference to God. Sure. Um, 
there's actually in my introductory chapter of volume one, there is a short subsection in which I deal with this point. And um, in English, uh, there are just three pronouns that one can use, he, she, or it. Um, if you want to be gender neutral, you could say it, but there's a problem with that because I would use it to refer to my car or my chair or my computer or any inanimate object would be an it. Consequently, it seems demeaning and inappropriate to refer to God as an it. Now, culturally, we could arbitrarily choose to say either he or she, and it wouldn't make any difference. But we have centuries of custom and tradition to overthrow. So for example, if I did my entire talk and anytime I referred to God as a, in the, with the pronoun and said she, everyone in the audience would think that I was saying God is female. When that's not my intention, but given the baggage of cultural tradition, it would be unavoidable. So I simply ask the, the reader's pardon to just let me get by with convention in this one instance. Um, I don't mind in many circumstances to break with convention. It's just, we don't have a good pronoun choice to make. Some, actually my personal hope is someday the worldwide community of English speakers will come up, <coughs> excuse me, will come up with a, a new pronoun that will get introduced into English that will refer to God only. And it will be neither he nor she by connotation. We could use gi. No, no, God. I don't want to use gi. <laughs> it has to be something that would be dignified, that it would carry connotations of reverence and love and beauty of God, something that that the sincere believers around the world could embrace without feeling that their their relationship with the deity is being undermined in any way. So it's funny to make jokes about it, but if humanity ever gets to that point, um, it would be, be something that people would have to thoughtfully choose uh -huh. and, um, and, and, with the, and it would be intentional that it, it, the connotation includes reverence and respect for the Almighty. Right. So right. it's a great question and it's asked very often. I like the question. It's difficult. It really is a very difficult point i think you you expressed the situation well in my writing if i come across a phrase where god is referred to as he i'll just use i'll just use dot 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 bracket god but that's awkward and i use god self god self actually is catching on in scholarly writings but it's, i think sounds strange to everyone else so well uh, the baha'i writings whether we like it or whether we don't like it, the Baha'i writings simply say he, he, him. And so um, with all due respect, there are so many battles to fight. I don't really want yeah. to fight that battle. Yeah, that's a good point. That's but I'm, point. Hoping, I'm hoping that humanity will get there. And I look forward to that day. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, Sandra, says these graphics and charts are incredible, outstanding. Are they all in the book? No, actually today I gave you some content that I developed after the book, but uh, some of the graph, let me think. Actually, some of the graphics, most of the graphics I developed afterwards when I started doing PowerPoint presentations, but there are many graphics in the book um, here. So the, the audience can see me? Uh -huh. Okay. So here's one graphic. Uh -huh. Yeah. A, a bit of the timeline. Yeah, that and one that, looks similar to one you put up. Yeah, that, this, this, that's, this is the one I put up. Yeah. Okay, that's in the book. And let me see. Um, 
this one is really, really interesting. It's, I didn't use it today. It's just a table from what we can see. Can you, can you see it's Arabic on one side and English on the other? Yes, yes, I see that. Okay, so this is the first 10 verses of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. On the right is Arabic, and on the left is English. And the verses are numbered in side by side. Huh. The circles is the Arabic word Allah, which means the God. And then the bold letters on the other side in the English is God. And if you look at the Arabic, and if you look at where God is, the, the word Allah is in the exact place in the Arabic translation of the Bible where it occurs in English. Hmm. So here is the Bible, not the Quran, the Bible. Hmm. And it is an Arabic translation. So if you're a Christian person, for example, in Egypt, and your native language is Arabic, and you want to pick up a Bible in your native language, this is what you'll see. You'll see an Arabic Bible. And you'll see where it says Allah conforms exactly to the word where the word God is. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, I had yeah. heard that Allah was used in Christian churches uh, regularly as the word for God and in, in, in Arabic speaking parts of the world. And that's a useful point to Absolutely. make. And there's many other graphics in here, but um, see if I can find some more. Do you want me to do this? No, I've got some more questions here. Okay, carry on. Uh, Robert asks, what was the reason for choosing the Abrahamic line instead of discussing the other lines in, uh, or including non-Abrahamic manifestations? That's an excellent question, also addressed in the intro chapter of my book. Basically, the problem is me. I'm just not sufficiently expert in all of the religions of the world that I thought that I had the skill or the ability to take it on. My hope is that if this approach to studying religion were to catch on, that other scholars would come along in the future and fill in the gap. The problem, there's nothing wrong with Buddha and Zoroaster and Noah, and the, well, Noah's, anyway, uh, pre-Abrahamic, but, um, or what did I? Um, Krishna. Krishna, right. Krishna is in the charts. That I, I show it on the timeline. But um, Krishna, Buddha, and Zoroaster, I just personally, I'm just not smart enough. And so I didn't want to take it on and I didn't want to mess it up. Sure. And so I just chose a, a line that I felt I could handle with competence and ability. And I leave it to the audience to decide whether I did that or didn't do it. Yeah, and I think where Krishna is concerned, it's my my shortcomings. Sure. Well, I think where Krishna is concerned, it's very difficult to know what to do with Krishna. You've got Krishna in at three thousand BCE, and I would say he's, if he existed at all, he's more like seven hundred BCE. Um, the the texts of the Bhagavad Gita exist in a language that didn't exist five thousand years ago. Uh, the Indo-European speaking people weren't in India then. They were probably in Central Asia or Turkey. So um, I should so have talked to you when problems. I was researching my book. <laughs> huh? I should have talked to you when I was researching my book. Well, this is a, a, a huge historical problem when you get anything before a, even Moses and Muhammad. Uh, the the error brackets on the dates of the manifestations get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know. Um, Zoroaster may have been 1500 BCE, it may have been 1000 BCE, it may have been 450 BCE. Uh, Buddha is plus or minus about 150 to 200 years, Abraham about 200 years, plus or minus, Moses about plus or minus 100 years. Um, it becomes very difficult um, to pin just these like, down. Just let the audience know, I did try to do my homework. But I certainly don't claim to be infallible. And if I made mistakes, let me just apologize. <laughs> these, are always, these are very difficult decisions to make, actually, historically. It's hard to know what to do. I did what I could. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Don asks, um, may we be free to use and adapt the content of your PowerPoint presentation? How can we get the PowerPoint in PowerPoint format? 
I'm not making that available at this time. Yeah, we'll we'll put so it up as PDF. In PDF. And if somebody wishes to design their own PowerPoint slides, with all respect to the audience, this is copyrighted. You know, it's I'm producing it. It has a copyright to it. Yeah. So, but if you, it, it, I'm sharing the slides in PDF format. And so if somebody wants to sit down at their computer and be inspired by a slide that I made and come up with their own, it's totally fine. Sure. I, um, I don't send anybody with that, but you know. No, that's, that's a perfectly legitimate point. And, and you know, the Wilmot Institute wants to remind people of exactly this, is that we're providing information, but sometimes the information is copyrighted and people need to remember that and respect it. Don also asks, how does science as the other knowledge system fit within the model of learning, particularly as related to belief in God? Very, very interesting. It's a good um, question. Yeah, yeah. So, give me a moment here. It is. I wrote down uh, page one thirty nine. Okay. So. Let me see, how do I do this? All right. So, chapter 14. Yeah. Okay. Is that good? Chapter 14. In this section, which was the section on divine reality, <clears throat> I describe a variety of characteristics about God. Okay, first off, in this section, I identify the oneness of God as the starting point for any analysis. And then I dealt with a question about controversies among the religions. Does everybody have the same God or not? Obviously, you know from having heard my presentation, the answer is yes, but I discussed that in the book and the controversies. And then there's one, two, three, four chapters in a row which single out specific attributes of God. The first one is the personal God. So God personally is involved in each and every one of us. The prayer hearing, prayer answering God. Chapter 14, which I just showed you, is the God of history. I'll come back to that in a second. And then the final one is that he's the creator of infinite worlds. So that's chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15. So in chapter 14, I explain, where's my camera? I explain that God is the God of history. So what does that actually mean? So from one point of view, whenever God sends a messenger of God into human history, that is absolutely God intervening into history. And this is one of the key themes of the Old and New Testament, that not just that there's this powerful God out there somewhere doing something that we don't know what that was. Actually, from time to time, God gets involved with human history by sending the messengers in the first place. So that's not answering the question about science yet, but I'm getting there. Okay. But the other part is that God is the creator. And God is the creator set up the universe to operate in a certain way. He, in, in theory, as far as our human minds can grasp, he must have had an infinity of ways of setting things up. Well, the universe that we find ourselves in, it was what he decided upon, gravity, light, energy, space, time, all that stuff, right? And so, literally speaking, God is the author of all of the natural laws. This is not a new idea, by the way. This goes back to Jewish and Christian thinking. The Muslims figured it out. You know, lots of people have understood that if you're the creator and if the creation has laws by which it operates, that it was God that put those laws in place in the first place. So there's a section in my book 
where it's down at the bottom of the page there. It says, God established the natural laws. I see it. Yep. And then God sustains everything he created through the power of the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, he guides and everything. Anyway, so God, God guides individual people. And then here's something very, very important. God has set a goal for history. History is going somewhere. It's not, from the Baha'i point of view, it's not random. <laughs> Certainly we human beings exercise our free will, but through the influence of the messengers, God is going somewhere. So now let's come back to the natural laws. So from the point of view of the Baha'i teachings, uh, when we study the natural universe, we are studying a book, a book that was revealed by God. It's the book of nature, as the philosophers of old have referred to. Guys like Newton and Kepler and Copernicus, they were all into this. They loved the idea of the natural world as the book of God. Kepler, when he figured out the orbital routines of the planets, he said he was reading the mind of God, stuff like that. So right. whoever, whoever a, thought God was going to use ellipses instead of circles, but God did. Yeah. <laughs> so, so from the Baha'i point of view, uh, we absolutely are in harmony with the idea that science is a way of knowing uh, what, what God's intentions have been and are. Um, we don't agree with the pure materialists who say that there's no goal or end purpose in sight, that, that it's not going anywhere. Um, we observe the same as the biologists do, the gradual emergence of complexity. So that's, we're fine with all that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but we do believe that there's a goal for history. And that's what my talk was about, discussing the goal of history is ultimately the design curriculum is taking us to um, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, when it, which in itself is merely the launching pad for who knows what wonderful things to come. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. does that answer the question? I could meander on a little longer. I think, I think more or less, yes. It, it relates science to the divine and, and physical nature to the divine quite well. Actually, I'm gonna. I want to say one more thing. I just thought of one more thing. It's really interesting. Um, the uh, give me two seconds here. There is a section in my book where it was just very relevant. I discuss the Copernican revolution. Right. That's, that's part of the story of all of creation being a classroom. But that's and there's a thing about Mars, the retrograde Mars. The lady that asked about uh, graphics. Um, um, there's a thing in here about the anthropic principle having to do with um, how physical reality seems from the very moment of the Big Bang uh -huh. to have been fine-tuned for the eventual emergence of life, of life uh, and complex life. And there's certain, a number of pages where there's a wonderful exploration of this concept of the anthropic principle. It's good. But, but then there's another se section in here when we're talking about what the creator creates, where I bring out, where is it? Okay, the definition of the human being. And this <clears throat> brings me to a discussion of the, whoo, I can't get this right, I'm reversed. There we are. Okay. There you go. Creation versus uh, evolution debate. Right. And I talk about in this section the evolutionists, the young earth creationists, <clears throat> the old earth creationists, huh. the intelligent designers, and the category that I would like to raise my hand to be a part of is called the mature monotheist. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I aspire to. I want to be that. Anyhow, good. sounds good. <laughs> and um, but this is surprising conclusion. It turns out that the evolutionists 
and the creationists, and I'm talking particularly about the young Earth creationists, they actually fundamentally agree on a very, very most central point, is that the reason they're having an argument at all is because the definition of a human being that they adopt, both of them, is the human body. Yeah. They define humanity as the body. So the, the evolutionists, of course, you'd expect that from them, but the creationists defining human reality as the body kind of misses the whole point about being made in God's image and right. you know the spiritual reality of man. So this is fun page here. They both they both define the human being as the human body. Yeah. But then Yeah. So you don't have to worry about evolution because it hasn't changed in a few thousand years kind of thing. Okay. But yeah. when the look at the look at this little box at the bottom, when the focus of inquiry shifts from the body to the ultimate spirituality of man, the soul, right. just over the origins of the human body becomes irrelevant. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a very good point. <laughs> anyway, very good point. it's a wonderful subject, and it should be explored more. Right. Well, we do have one more one more comment, which uh, as an appropriate last comment, and that's thank you, Ed. I appreciate your kindly manner manner in delivering this webinar this webinar will be wonderful to share with many friends so i think that's a very nice way a um, kind perfect way of wrapping things up from the comments of the audience i think i better share my screen now so i can sort of let people know what's coming in the future and again ed thank you so much well i had a wonderful time and um i i feel honored that you asked me to do this and if i can ever do this for you again you know, um, raise my hand, I'd love to do it. Well, keep that in mind. We've got uh, lots of, uh, we've had some really excellent presentations in the past and I can certainly count yours among that list. Thank you so much.